for sale. Today on Rune Revival, we'll be looking at the phonological shifts from Proto-Germanic to Old English, and what measures the Anglo-Saxon rune masters took to handle those changes. As a reminder, this chart shows a summary of what we discussed last time about Proto-Germanic consonant sounds, IPA and runes. Note that the circled sounds were allophones. To discuss Old English, we need to add two columns for post-alveolar and glottal sounds. You will also see on this chart that m, m, p, p, l, and r have all stayed in the same place and remain written with the same runes. Possibly under Celtic influence, t and d moved from being dentals to alveolars, but they were still written the same way anyway. However, it would seem the Anglo-Saxons' liberal use of ng at the end of words made rune masters think that an undersized rune for it was unbefitting. Consequently, they enlarged it to match the other runes. As you will see going on, one of the key differences between Elder Futhark and Anglo-Frisian Futhark is that the latter is a majuscule script. As English continued to develop, the velifricative H began to see competition from the glottal H. Could this be what gave rise to the double-barred hail rune alongside its single-barred form? With the palatial h also beginning to appear, that would have given rise to a question about whether a sound previously thought of as an allophone of g should be distinguished or not. Evidence from the corpus would tend to suggest rune masters held varying opinions across time and place. But, as the purpose of this video is to move towards modern English, we shan't discuss them all right now. The important thing here is merely to observe that some runes were being used to indicate multiple sounds. Now, let's step back to something a little easier. With the shift from Proto-Germanic to Old English, these bilabials became labials, giving us the f and v sounds. But, whereas Proto-Germanic treated v as an allophone of b, Old English considered v an allophone of f. Consequently, the rune theo was used for both. With d having become an alveolar, it made little sense for v to remain allophonic with it. Thus, it became an allophone of th instead. More problematically for our sakes, whereas Proto-Germanic had clearly distinguished between s and z, Old English conflated them as allophones. Consequently, the rune we're calling Elks was completely dropped in favour of Seal. Moving back to Velas, again the Anglo-Saxon rune masters decided to enlarge the K rune. However, that sound was undergoing a split where it was sometimes pronounced CH. As time progressed, that led to the introduction of a mirrored bind rune in cases where K needed to be clearly denoted. At this point, let's add in the digraph the Anglo-Saxons used for sh, combining s with ch. Although initially treated as an allophone of ch, the j sound came to be written as double yivu, presumably as a result of the connection between the post-alveolar stops and the velar stops. That leads us to our final consonant, y. Again, the rune masters across England were divided on how to handle it. But they all agreed it had to change. Some placed a stave straight down the middle between its two bows. Others put its bows back to back 
and enlarge them while giving smaller bows to the G rune to distinguish them. Still others appear to have reversed the bows but kept them small while adding a stave. So that's all the Anglo-Saxon consonants covered. We skipped a few details but that should be enough to give you a sufficient understanding of how consonant runes worked in Old English. After all, the purpose of this video is to establish a foundation whereupon we can build a system for writing today's English in runes. Next up, we'll look at how Old English shifted Proto-Germanic vowels. Are you ready for that?